Okay, right. So this is it. The last chapter. We did it. Made it to the end of the book. <laughs> uh, I mean, I hope we all learned a lot. I know I did. I learned a lot. So I'm happy to uh, have gone through this book. Um, this was meant to be kind of a replacement for doing the um, statistical rethinking since this, we don't do statistical rethinking in this community anymore because it's not a freely available book. So which is a shame because it is a great book. Um, Anyway, so this chapter is the adding more layers chapter. Uh, as you know, we so far we've used individual level uh, predictors, like for example, the age or the oxygen used, remember in the climbers data. Um, we've used, um, but we haven't used group level predictors. So the question is, how can we do that? Oh, it's a group level predictor. It's like something like, oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think for the climbing data. It could be um, the health, the height of the peak, for example, right? That could be something that's useful, right? Uh, oh, I said peak, but we didn't do peak grouping, but we are going to, because we're going to look at more than one grouping variable. So it's not in addition to just the expedition that people are grouped into, it's also the um, peak that they that expedition was on. So that's group more than one grouping variable. Those are the two kind of missions for this chapter. Um, now, everybody's read the chapter, I presume, right? Everybody's up to date. Yeah. Yep. Did you guys do any of the exercises? No. I, I, I haven't finished okay. the analysis for it. <laughs> But I'm going to run through all of them. I didn't either. I only did like the easy, the beginning. I didn't do any of the analytical exercise. I only did the, the kind of initial exercise. So if we have time at the end. We can look at that briefly. Uh, awesome. But it's not a, what do you call it? That's a goal, not threshold or something. Like that. Mm, right. <laughs> so first we're going to look at group level predictors. I'm going to go back to that Airbnb data that we looked at previously, but instead of looking at the reviews, number of reviews, we're gonna look at the price. And without any justification, we're gonna look at, the, without any detailed justification, we'll get the log price. And the reason for that is the log price, it looks like it's more normally distributed. So the prices and money often is log normally distributed. In the sure. book, they justify that further by looking at the um, PP check, right? The posterior uh, distribution, it seems to match well with this and using just the straight price does a terrible job, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so log normal is what we're going to use for the Airbnb data. And then if we look at the uh, individual level predictors for the price, we can see, oh, this all makes sense, right? More bedrooms means it's going to be more expensive, uh, better rating, more expensive. Uh, an entire home is more expensive than a share. Sorry that these letters are shoved on each other, but this is the entire home. This is a private room and this is a shared room. So this makes sense as well, right? Now, these are just you know, completely pooled or unpooled, I forget which is what it's now. Is it unpooled? Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sorry, no, it's completely, it's completely pooled because completely you're pooled, not right. looking at the group level structure, then uh, an unpooled model is where you, you know, you're looking at each individual group and you're thinking that there's no similarity between those, uh, any of them. Right. right, so this is the unpooled data and we expect that some of this variation will be, can be counted for by when we pool the data. But this is just, just trying to show general trends here that these are individual level predictors. But there is a hierarchy here, and we can see, for example, that this is now all the different 43 neighborhoods in the data. And this is the media, this is next sorry, this is the, the box plot of the log price for each one of those neighborhoods. We can see there is a lot of variability like this neighborhood number 13, relatively cheap, right? And this mm -hmm. neighborhood up here, or even this one, some of these have larger spreads than others. But yeah, there's a wide variation. So we're definitely going to want to use neighborhood as a grouping variable, like we did previously uh, in a chapter 18, I guess it was, I don't know, in a previous chapter, let's put it that way. But again, again uh, this are, just feel free to interrupt me anytime that this fails to gel, or, or more importantly, interrupt me if there's a section, ah, this part of the book, I was completely confused by that kind of thing, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a part that I was a little confused by that I'm gonna talk about it later at the end. So, we're going to start with the now the other thing in this data is there is a group level predictor each neighborhood has a couple of group level variables like the, the one, there's mm -hmm. two that they mentioned here's one's walkability which is how easy it is to get the stuff nearby on foot right it's actually right. called the walk score and the other one is the transit score um which is access to public transit in that neighborhood so these are these are for the entire neighborhood like albany park the walk score is 87 it's not each individual residence that you could put Airbnb that's in that community. All every or another way to say is every one of those uh, Airbnb rentals has exactly the same 
walk score in that neighborhood. It's a group level predictor. Uh, so in the in this chapter, they use walk score. They don't bother with the trans score, but just as an example, they use the walk score to try to explain now some of the variation from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, so we can do a grouping by neighborhood and walk score and just see how much of a predictor that is. And, and as you might expect, the median uh, log price does improve or improve, get more expensive with uh, improved walk score. So this seems like something we should add to our model, right? <laughs> But can I ask right. what's what's confusing about it? I mean, is that what, what, what were you finding confusing? Because you're doing a great job explaining. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I miss I, I not anything to do with this section at the end uh, end 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 of the oh, 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 the, end of the, uh, right. the second part. Yeah, sorry. No, I'll, I'll yeah. So to incorporate the group low predictors, we end up you know complicating our model a little bit more. So uh, if you remember from the book, it looks like this is the log price is distributed normally with this mean, which again has this uh, group level intercept. And these are all the individual intercepts, right? For the other mm -hmm. things we're scoring by bedrooms, rating room type. And the group level predictor uh, regression comes into the distribution for this intercept, which is normally distributed with its own mean, which now instead of just being a single uh, tweak or, or um, uh, group level intercept is now uh, each one has its regression coefficient. So we're accounting for some of the variability in the group level intercepts with this regression on walkability. And it seemed, to me, this seemed like, well, oh, this seems like kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but it turns out to actually do it. It's super simple. You just add walk score <laughs> to your model right here, right? There's, only difference. Yeah. Uh, there's an Airbnb model one in the book and the Airbnb model two, Airbnb model two just has this added on. So. Mm -hmm. This all looks complicated, but it's actually relatively straightforward to, to account for it. And if yeah. you think about it, the reason why is I could actually just move this gamma one mu j up here in mm -hmm. the top line, couldn't I? Right, because normal distribution is just, it's just a shift. So I can just, just add it over here instead. <laughs> it doesn't matter where I put that. And that's all that's really happening here, right? Well, yeah. And you notice uh, another thing I did, I... Sorry, go ahead, Ron. I know you go ahead if you had an insight there I want to definitely hear it oh well I mean I think what's really nice about this is is uh, so it's like we have the transit score and we have the walk score so the, what's cool about it is like so we, you know if we if we didn't have those things we would just have a bunch of variants related to location or whatever exactly yeah and so now it's like we so have now we're gonna exp yeah now we have this opportunity to say it's not not only is it about being in these different places you know it's it's you know you know one or both of these you know scores or whatever which yeah. yeah that's cool so now we have a way to explain some of the variance like why is this neighborhood better for example right that's what we're doing right right well and as far as like what you said about like putting the stuff in this this is like i don't know if you have much experience with like multi-level models but like all of the no but you do <laughs> i don't have a lot first of all actually even i don't i mean it's weird like i have a lot of you know sort of experience with like mixed effects model kind of language which is really the same thing but like a lot of times they love yeah. their they love their gamma zeros and their i mean the the, the multi-level model folks you know so that's why i think we're seeing these two separate um hierarchies you know as a way ah, of okay. showing, I gotcha. the way of showing like the, the the first line is the individual level right and then the second one is the um, location level. Does that make sense? Anyway, you probably already yeah, did this, but it does yeah. make sense to split it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make sense to split it up like that. I'm just saying in terms of, in this particular case, it's just a matter of adding it in there uh, because of the way the normal distribution works. I suppose if this was a different distribution that could complicate things a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's also because you're assuming, you're assuming independence and in, yeah, 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 in a way that you're not above, I guess. So that's yeah. So uh, I just so when, when I went through and fit this, I didn't bother putting in all the specific priors. I just let the stand GLMR mm -hmm. do the week week of formative priors for everything. Uh, basically, works the same. I didn't really check like do a prior check and do any of that stuff. I just you know this I just plowed through it right like you're not supposed to because it's just for illustration, but. Um, it worked fine, so I didn't have to retype all that stuff, which was nice. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, G Stan GMR can pick pretty good priors for you. Uh, 
But you all, of course, always have to check those things, right? By the way, I, I don't so, know if this is not, but, like, but the, maybe the most important thing I can contribute to this whole conversation is, I believe it's pronounced Galmer. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying different things. Galmer, okay. I'm trying yeah, Galmer, so, G so, G so, Gilmer. Elmer, yeah, so when it's, when it's, when it's, when it's not general, it's, it's L-M-E-R, it's Elmer. I, I thought it was oh. Lemur. Like, you know, like the, yeah. the cute little um, thingies. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I did a whole, like, Twitter, po uh, Twitter like, poll on this, and, well, I got, like, five respondents. Um, but, yeah, everyone was like, no, it's Elmer, so Gelmer. Oops, anyway. sorry. What is, um, uh, do you still see the right screen? I was clicking around things, looking things up, and I realized that I just wanted to look at what it is. So, so it stands for linear model, linear mixed effects regression. Is that what it stands for? Yes. Exactly. Right. Uh, okay. So remember, we, we were, I think we talked about this last week, you know, this idea of most traditionally, it would be something where you have repeated um, measurements of the outcome at the individual level, right? And so now you have, you have the measurements that are um, nested within individual, right? Yeah. And as we could, as we could say here, by adding more layers, you could have, you know, repeated measurements at the individual level and the individuals are nested within classrooms or schools or whatever yeah so i mean it can can get computationally yeah. expensive very quickly anyway so for this model this is the results we get um all these you know looking at the standard errors all the uh it, these are like the global i guess or what do you call them the, the global um yeah, global not mixed right. <laughs> the fixed, yeah. fixed effects. There you go. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, for this model, and you can this leads to some kind of a median model that the median log price will follow this one. You know, just plug in all these things in there. This, if you have want to make a prediction for another room, you just a median log price for another place, you just put in those variables there the walk score. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, you can see that I grouped it with parentheses, but it's really not, it's you know, it's no different than the rest of these terms that are in here, right? Uh, so the book calls out like one example is like every 10 points of walkability increases the median log price by about 17%, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so, but oh, the other thing that they point out is, um, no, never mind. So that's, I'm thinking of something else. And then looking at the, what you were saying, right? Looking at the random effects now, the uh the interesting thing here is that and i don't show it here but in the book they show that the neighborhood to neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. variability was like 0.3 i think it was now went down to 0.2 because we have explained some of that variation using this exactly neighborhood walkability maybe if we add and if we added in maybe the transit scores if there's some other group level ones we could perhaps explain more of that and, uh, and if i can if i can be that guy right now the, the old crook curmudgeonly guy you could put in something completely random and explain, um, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, potentially more variance, right? So this is one of the reasons why people a lot of times say, well, you know, should you know, should we just explain more variance, or should we have, you know, if you always want to have a theoretically more meaningful model, right? Just including things, you know, you'll 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 get higher, you know, R squared scores, but at, yeah. at what cost, right? Anyway, that's my, uh, that's my soapbox. That's my, yeah. Soapbox. Well, I mean, that's why you, yeah, I, I get your point. That's why it's important to do things like cross validation and make sure you're not fitting noise. Right. Um, and yeah. just like thinking about what could actually generate your data, which is like, yeah. obviously a lot yeah. more like, which that's is obviously right. like a lot more like less technical. It's just a lot more, obviously like there's theory, but also like whatever your domain expertise is. Um, not just like, yeah. yeah, like throwing every variable and sim and seeing like, oh, well, <laughs> I've explained something, but you like don't know really what you explained. And I guess I brought it up because I don't know about you guys, but like I work with PIs, like, you know, uh, principal investigators who are like, this, this model explains, you know, more variants that you're like, but we threw in this thing that we have really dubious, you know, <laughs> yeah. we, don't really, we don't really have any theoretical reason. And like R squared will always just go up. Like, yeah. will, like always like right by the but math it, just like that's yeah. that. <laughs> but it, it is a hard thing to kind of walk people through right because i think a lot of people just think well it's just obvious that we want more explanation of yeah yeah 
anyway it's something i deal with a lot which is <laughs> we have to right size our models more isn't mm -hmm. always better all right uh, so this next section talks about the neighborhood level trends that we want to look at what these different neighborhood uh, group level neighborhood level intercepts look like uh, we can do that as well right so for example he focuses on like two neighborhoods that have the same mean log price but they have different vastly different walkability ratings edgewater which has a walkability of 89 really nice place apparently to walk around in pullman apparently there's nothing nearby except maybe train yards or something i don't know uh so and he looks at what the effect of doing including this group level predictor was on the group level intercepts and that's this plot here that they provide which i just cut and paste this i didn't generate this i didn't generate the first model at all right so the closed circles on here are the group the model we just talked about with the group level intercepts the open circles are the model without the group level intercepts in at the the model the model one that they call it airbnb model one in the in the book and the interesting thing is that for pullman which has only like five listings the the group level predictor helps inform our understanding of the group level intercept for pullman by pulling it down toward the trend line in terms of walk, walkability score and so that's another kind of grouping or shrinkage type effect that happens with uh when you add group level predictors to these things and, the, and just to be clear this pullman intercept is includes this group level Mm -hmm. regression coefficient in it but still the overall group level uh, coefficient now or group level intercepts move down toward the toward the trend line so we're saying what well, we think of the uh the baseline um prices in that neighborhood is now been pulled down because it's like it, we have so few data so we were thinking the baseline was higher but now we have more data it was actually we don't have that much data we should pull that baseline down to inform the fact that this walkability should have bigger effect on it hmm or I should say that we're the lack of walkability in this case, right? Oh, right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the lack of walkability should pull that price down, how much you'd pay for it. Okay. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. Yep. I'm not sure I explained that perfectly well, but. All right, moving on to two or more grouping variables. In particular, we're going to look at the climbing data. We already looked at that before, right? So we've already done this model before with the model of successor climber grouped by expedition. But when you look at the data a little closer, you'll see actually there's each expedition is grouped into the expeditions are grouped further into peaks for those whatever peak that particular expedition was on. And for example, there's a peak called Ama Dabla, and there are several expeditions to that peak with different numbers of climbers on it. It says right. here that of the, yeah. the 2,000 climbers are grouped into 200 expeditions to 46 different peaks. And it's a nested hierarchy like this. Well, they did, there's peaks. Each peak mm -hmm. has a bunch of expeditions. Each expedition has a bunch of climbers. That's kind of this grouped effect. And so to, to account for that variability, again, as, I, as they say, we don't really care so much about the particular peaks in the data, but we do want to incorporate it and account for it as a grouping variable. And then we end up now with this mess it looks a little bit like when you just first look at it but for you like that one guy i forget who it was but i think it was you robert that pointed me to this youtube video and this guy likes to say you know was it you no sorry some i'm sorry it's a different yeah. actually a different book club but some of you were saying there's a youtube video this guy likes to talk about like let just stare at this equation and let it sing to you <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I can say i've never watched that <laughs> <laughs> oh it was about it was a video on boosted trees that's what it was i remember now Got it. Oh, are you talking about? Uh, are you talking about Stack Quest? The the, the this yeah, that's Quest. the one. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. I think I, I, I think I actually did post one of his like a link to one of his. That's, yeah. That guy's great. Just yeah. Great so in any event, uh, in this case, what we're doing is simply adding in a new tweak, right? So we had a tweak for the expedition. We're going to add a tweak for the the peak grouping now too. And just like the expedition is going to be normally distributed with some with some uh, prior for the sigma of the peak to peak, right? Peak to peak variation. So the model is pretty similar to what we did before. We're just adding in another tweak. And now we just have, um, uh, of course, we have to add more subscripts, right? Now, why is the success of the ice climber, ice, ice, not the ice climber, which is not the type of thing, but the ice climber who climbed the Jaith peak in the Kaith expedition, right? So it's nested. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, the data is nested, right? This model doesn't really appear. Uh, it's interesting because the nesting structure is in the data. It's not really in this model, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how important if it was unnested, would it would make a difference. I don't know, but. Wait a minute, right. hold on. Well, sorry, uh, what are you saying? What wouldn't make a difference? Yeah. Can you... Well, in this case, the data has this nested structure and the book called that out, right? This is one of the things I think, uh, mm -hmm. what's one of you guys had some insight on, right? What if it wasn't nested? I mean, of course, in this case, hard to imagine how it couldn't be nested. And exhibitions don't go to more than one peak, but in other things, people could belong to, or uh, the lowest level could belong to multiple groups in some, or different grouping structure might not be nested. But I don't see that nesting uh, feature in here, so I don't know if it actually would have mattered that much to this nester. Maybe it does. I didn't. I should have thought about this some more before I brought it up. But um, yeah, like so you're like you're saying, it's relevant. Are you like asking if it's like relevant to go like a step further, or maybe no? I'm relevant. saying is in this case the data is nested, right? Peaks yep. expeditions belong to peaks, right? And climbers belong yep. to expeditions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that important to how this model is structured, the nesting part itself? That's what I don't understand. I, I'm not clear on, I should say. Well, okay, so now you got me thinking about it. So yeah. So the top line is like... Because this model doesn't look nested. Hmm. So it's with plot, and then... I mean, the model, there's no... The nesting structure is not reflected in this 19.8 equation, right? Well, it's not... I mean, isn't that... It's like reflected at least in the, I guess, the predictors, right, and the betas. Right, so like it would be like plus beta one x i j k. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of a good example, like um, J right, yeah, J is the expedition. Like I'm trying to here's an example, like maybe it's kind of a bad one, but imagine we had student success in some class and we, we were grouping it by schools, which makes sense. We also they each one of them used it potentially not let's say there's also a choice of several uh a sampling of different textbooks that they use, right? So it's not we don't want to use that as a necessarily as a predictor, but that might be another grouping thing. But there's no it wouldn't be nested in that case right because well it would be implicitly schools, nested uh, right now assuming if no, you're i guess it would be it would be nested implicitly if, i guess it still is sort of nested if, if each classroom but the point is a student would yeah if each, so if a student each would be part of a classroom group but you also be part of a textbook group and being part of a textbook group doesn't tell you which classroom group you're in and being part of a classroom group doesn't tell you which textbook group you're in right like if I'm in expedition three, I'm definitely in peak two. I know that for a fact because expedition two only three only had to do with peak two. But in my other example is not that way. And, I and I, if I built that model, it wouldn't look any different. <laughs> hmm. I'd have textbook tweak and I'd have a classroom tweak. And, and in fact, we go to the next chart real quick. You'll see that you know in here as well when you build that model, there's no nesting. It's just you know added on, right? <laughs> so. Well, no, but that's that's. I'm that's... just curious. No, no, no. Okay, so the, the, to your. Um... Yeah, to your point, it is that that is how you're showing the nesting because the the the, the equation knows like which variables are very are, are they have variance at the row level versus the groups of row levels, right? right? Um, by the way, so your point about the whole textbook versus classroom thing, um, that's the I mean, I'm, unless I'm missing something, like you know, the typical situation would be everyone in the same classroom uses the same book, right? So no, I'm sorry, I should have said school, school versus. Oh, so, okay. So, I mean, what I'm saying is it's true that every, or even, if, yeah. So that in this, within the school, there could be a, a class that does, um, I guess like we could have a class that uses, like, see, in that case, I'm starting to think I'd use it as a group level predictor instead, just group by class and then it would be nested again. I don't know. Anyway, I'll think about it some more, but I just want to bring that right. point up. That I mean, know, my main point was just to say you don't see the nesting structure in these equations, right? That you do in there, but it's in it's in the data. It is, yeah. And so you it's have to. Data. So yeah, I mean, yeah. it's one of those things where, you know, this is why I was like, you know, make sure you pick the predictors that make the most sense. Don't just throw stuff in there because, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you could do all kinds of you know nested craziness. You know what I mean? um that makes no sense and so yeah a lot of this stuff is about making sure that it's theoretical 
ramifications. Yeah. But yeah, no, like the, the okay. um, yeah, I see your point though. The difference between grouping variable yeah. and a grouping, a, a group level predictor is, is weird. Okay. So the, um, and just to point this out that there's two variabilities now, there's a variability success rate, sigma B from expedition, expedition within a peak, right? And then there's a variability between peaks. So we have two kinds of sources of variability now before we had just the one. So to simulate the model again, it's like, here's model one that didn't include the, the peak ID. And then to add the peak ID, you just add it on. It's like relatively straightforward again. It's much more easier to write the, the oh, how do you say it? Gilmer? I already forgot now. Gilmer. 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 Glimmer. Glimmer. I don't know. Gelmer, Elmer, so, yeah, Elmer, e Gelmer, yeah, Gelmer. Gelmer. <laughs> it's much easier to write. The, it's much e hard, easy. It's easier to write it down than it is to say. That's for sure. Anyway, <laughs> it's easy enough to add in this nested structure. We just add it on this group. This multi-level uh, structure. So, and I. This is just me. I ran the model. And, oh, like Ryan was saying last time. Like these things take some time. Was it Ryan? Were you saying this? Yeah. I think it was Ryan. Would these things take oh, a long to run? Time to yeah, run. yeah, yeah. It takes, it takes yeah. a long time to run. Well, I mean, you but can also, I mean, this. does it not have um, where you can split up the cores? So I think it, it, not, it seems just not doing that. Because what does it say? Ne I, know, I did it on the PC and the Mac. Neither one of them split the cores automatically. So maybe not, it's command. Oh, line yeah. So I, I've been, um, cause I've been playing with Brims. Maybe that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> BRMS, you know, the other uh, yeah, one. Yeah, now, yeah. now I'm questioning how to pronounce anything. It's like SQL or SQL, depending, you know, who you ask. Yeah. Um, oh, I, yeah, I no, say that's squirrel. The, that's, the... <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> that's honestly, that would make it more entertaining to use. Um, but I've been playing with I got to go consult the squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> to pull data with squirrels. See, that actually would be yeah. great. You say that's a six day old message. Yeah, no, I like that. But, um, yeah, but um, I've been playing with Brims a little bit, and there is, um, I would imagine it's the same thing. There's a argument to it where you can specify the number of like cores, right? So, like, I'll just put mine at like, I don't know, like two or whatever, right? Um, well, we can and that, then, it, then it will run the chains in parallel because I, I'm pretty sure if I had to take a guess that it'll run the chain sequentially. Um, so right, you go through all the stuff with one chain and then you go to the next chain, and obviously so on and so forth. Um, That's Brims. But in Brims, yeah, I usually just do like Never DRM, there's an option just for cores, which I would, I, I actually might look um, right now, but I think that's that would make it run faster if I had to take a guess. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, it's clearly using one core. Yeah. Yeah, the, some of the stuff that, you know, for like last week, it took 25 minutes to run. Yeah. It was, it was yeah, there is a, yeah, it looks like there is a cores um, that you can specify. Okay, yeah, you pass it to sampling. I think you might pass it as maybe a list or I don't know. It seems like you can. I mean, like I, I would be shocked if you couldn't. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's not obvious from yeah. the documentation. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it's fine. So though that's why I did the save and read because I was going back to this thing. I don't want to keep running it over and over again because I was <laughs> playing with some of the things at the end. Uh, so the next thing that happens is we want to compare now the two models with the two groups versus a single grouping structure. And that's what they did in the book. And this just reproduces that. And we can see that in this case, the adding the second, adding the um, grouping by peak didn't really change our, you know, global intercepts, global age coefficient at all, really, or in the oxygen use a little bit, right? Nothing significant changed in terms of that part of the model. But what does change is a different accounting of the variability of the success rates. So before, uh, there is, it was the expedition from expedition variability was 3.6. Now that went down to 3.1. And because now we have this peak to peak, uh, variability to that accounts for some of that as well. So it's another way of like accounting for variability in a different way. Now we're accounting for variability from expedition to expedition. Some of that is from the, this fact that those expeditions were at different peaks, right? Some peaks are easier to climb, right? As we will see. And speaking of that, let's look at those group specific parameters now, right? So here's what the median, uh, VOD, odds model looks like right uh it's got the base the base 
the intercept has got tweaks for the peak, a tweak for the exhibitions, and tweaks for the peak, and then an intercept for oxygen and age, right? Uh, not intercept, slope uh, for oxygen and for age. I don't know which one's which, or it doesn't really matter. But um, when we look at these group level um, effects, we can get this, the posterior for these tweaks from it, right? And as an example, they look at here's some tweaks uh, for the peaks, right? Um, this one, the estimate is. 2.91, so I'm a Dablin, the must be an easy peak to climb, right? This is the, the mean, right? Mm -hmm. The must be an easy peak to climb because it's 2.91. And this one is uh, Annapurna 1, uh, minus 2.06, that's a must be a really hard peak to climb, right? The success for the log odds is, is reduced by minus two, right? So, uh, and the same thing is for expeditions. This expedition, this, now these are both to the same peak, I'm a Dablin, it turns out. Um, this expedition was kind of median level uh, success rate. And this guy, these guys, the leader of this expedition had it on the ball here, right? Plus, uh, plus three for the tweak for that expedition. Um, mm. So we can use this to make predictions. Uh, so for example, we have a climber going on a new expedition, not, not right to an existing peak. Let's go to the easy one. I'm a Doblin. Uh, so for the easy one, we have to use B equals zero because we don't have, uh, we have to use the median tweak for the for uh, expeditions, but we do we do have a peak tweak we can plug in. That's that 2.91 for I'm a Doblin. If we do that, we come up with the median success, well, median log odds, just plug in the, right, just do the math. There's the age, age oh, sorry, 30 year old guy that did not use oxygen. I forgot to say that part. So here's for the 30 years, here's for the peak. That's just the base intercept, right? Plug that in, take the inverse, lodge it on it, and it's a 50% probability chance of success for that guy not using oxygen. Uh, well, maybe he should use oxygen. Okay, let's add that in. So, oh, first, I just want to point out you can do this as well by just using um, posterior prediction. Just plug in this new data point, oxygen 30, no, I'm sorry, H30, oxygen not used um, as a new exhibition and to that peak, and it comes up with about the same answer, 49. 50% chance of success, right? So what this is doing is actually going into the posterior draws and computing a head, you know, flipping a weighted coin to figure out over and over and over again whether the guy succeeded on that peak. And I mentioned that because I say, well, what if he did use oxygen? Mm -hmm. Now I put the oxygen tweak in there, 6.2, and I find out, hey, it's almost a sure thing. There's a guy can't, can't fail, right? 99.8% chance of success. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it with the prediction, posterior prediction, right? So I put in the only thing different here is I put oxygen true. I actually get a different answer that's actually significantly different, 95% chance. Mm. So what's what's going on here? Um, it's, as I looked in this a little bit, it's, it, what's happening here is that we're doing the median here. And although, right, the logic function, inverse logic function is monotonic, so of course we expect that the median doesn't isn't impacted by that, but the mean is, and this is doing the mean. Uh, mm -hmm. because we're just counting up essentially when we say mean here we're really uh, just counting yeah. up all the ones right and dividing by how many ones there how many samples there were right and mm -hmm. so it should be lower so i decided to just take and we have time so i was going to take care of my little side trip here <laughs> on this to go through and do this manually the hard way as it were right so i took all the mm -hmm. draws from the posterior and i just picked out the ones i care about for this which and i renamed them the so i'll go down here to this table um, which are the baseline. So read these are all the 20,000 draws, right? This is the first six of them, but I got a baseline intercept. I've got an age coefficient. I've got oxygen use coefficient. I've got a tweak for the peak that we care about, AMA Doblin. And I got, and I don't have a peak. I don't have a tweak for the expedition because it's a new expedition. So I have an expedition sigma in here as well, right? Which I need to account for, right? This is the fact that I don't know what the peak tweak is for a new expedition, but I do know the variability from expedition to expedition, I better account for that, right? So that's this Sigma expedition. And so for each of those draws, I'm going to compute a random expedition tweak using that Sigma. Remember, these are squared. These are actually variances. These are squared. Uh, so I just kind of calculate a, a tweak for that particular draw. And then I'm going to compute now the, the log odds, right, based on the model, right? I did it twice, once without the tweak and one with the with the expedition tweak, just to show the difference between those two. We you don't account for that variation from expedition to expedition if you just use zero, right? Which is what we were using before. 
Uh, so skipping all this, if you plot out what the log odds look like, the blue curve is without accounting for the possibility of variation from expedition to expedition, and the red curve is accounting for it, right? So the medians are the same in the two cases, of course, because, you know, the median is zero. We put in zero, right? But there is wider variability when we account for the expedition to expedition um, yeah. tweak. That's what My, we mean by the tweak here. I'm going back to, I think it was like really early in the book when we were talking about um, getting summary statistics from different po like posteriors, right? And it was like, there was yeah. one posterior, I remember they showed in the book that was like very narrow and there's another one that was very wide. And I think it was like, if you took like median same or thing. mean or something, it was the same thing, but that doesn't yeah. tell you really anything as much until, because when you look at both distributions, they tell two completely separate stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the with tweak one is the correct thing to do because we have to, yeah. to the, that's what the model says, the model, right? So I was just, uh, I just put them both in just because that's something that seems to be left out of the previous model, which made a difference between the 99% and the 95%. So, so let's summarize, let's could do that. Let's calculate the, uh, the probability of success. I did that up here, probability of success to the inverse logic. Where did I do it all? Where did I do that? Hey, here, there. Right? Yeah. Added a column in there. So then I, okay, what's the median? What's the mean and what's the, you know, the spread, right? The, I did a 90, I did an 80% range, right? So with the tweak, which is the correct thing, we see that the mean is 95.4. Okay, that's what we got when we did the uh, posterior stimulation approximately. And then the median is 99.8. That's what we got when we did the, the median. So that all, right, the median model as it works is 99.8. And there's the spread of answers, right? So, well, um, and as I said before, the median is not affected by this logic logic uh, inverse logic thing but the mean of course is um and but the mean and the mean is what I'm, what I'm trying to make the point is the mean is what you get if you simulate the Bernoulli event over and over again like for each probability I did a draw you know got a came with a one or a zero and then counted them all that's what this kind of equation down here is showing but that's and that's what posterior predict does so posterior predict gave us so now now the point of this I think I understand now the posterior predict gives me this answer because it's doing the doing it maybe the right way I guess I don't know but it's you know it's simulating climbing it's simulating climbers for this model right and it's, it's clearly including the tweak because they got 95.4 not 99.7 so it's clearly doing the right thing um in my view where it's simulating a climber on an expedition with a random expedition tweak with a particular with uh with a tweak for the peak that's going on and then including oxygen and everything else and then simulating it and coming up the one or a zero and over and over and over again right for each one of those draws and that's what posterior simulation does. I, by the way, this is something that Bambi, the Python kind of equivalent, if you will, to this doesn't do very well at all. You can't, yeah. you have to do it manually. You can't get this thing out of Bambi directly for grouping things. Kind of a, one of the complaints I have about it. Uh, so, so what's the right answer? Well, when you're doing my, I guess my point is when you're doing Bayesian and things like this, you shouldn't report a single number. Maybe you should report this range, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is the range of what I think the probability could be for the climber's success. I mean, what am I going to tell this climber, right? Is it my, what's my chances here, buddy? Is it 95%, 99%? Well, we don't know. It's, it's, it's a range of possibilities, you know, the underneath percentiles from like 90% chance to 100% chance. Or we could just plot the, give them like the whole, you know, posterior distribution, which looks like this. And it's kind of interesting because the means like way down here, this thing's got a really long, you know, tail going off. This only goes, I only plot from 95 to 100 just so you can see things. It's all punched up against here. But maybe he looks at this and says, yeah, I'm going, right? I like this. You know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> hmm. So I just wonder if you guys had, had any insight on that aspect of it because I spent a lot of time messing around with this, trying to understand this. I think now I kind of understand it, but uh, it's kind of confusing because you're like, oh, if I did, did the posterior simulation, it just gives you a single number, 95%. Well, that seems weird, right? It's not a single number. I don't know for sure the probability. I have some uncertainty about the probability. And I think I've now captured what that uncertainty is. Yep. You did it better than I would have done. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, anyway, I hope it was helpful. <laughs> yeah. I, but yeah, part, I yeah, spent it's a little like, time with still... back and forth. And... Yeah, because I mean, that's the thing. It's like, right, when you just take one number, you lose like all of the uncertainty. Yeah. So like, even like when I was doing one project that worked, I've like talked about, right. It's like, obviously like we generated, let's say like a posterior for like what we think our win rate will be for like this, uh, for like one of our territories, right. That we're selling in. Right. Obviously. Yeah. And like that affects downstream that affects, um, we have like this planning model, right. To like determine, 
you know, like how many opportunities do we think we'll create? How many, like how much revenue do you think we bring in? Right. And that's like, so it's like what I did is like an input to something else. Right. Obviously though, I can't just like go over to a stakeholder and be like, oh, well, here's the posterior distribution, right? People still need to like make a decision based off of it. So you can like, essentially it kind of comes down to like, what we did is like, I essentially just like chopped up the posterior based on percentiles and then they could like visualize and like see, okay, what if like the win rate was 40%, right? For like, let's say this territory, what does it look like? Is that even a, but it, is that even like a plausible value, right? To like give them like a bit more insight into like, what is going like what could happen right um i think that like that's but yeah i mean then then it just i think gets into a whole different territory of like you still have to make make a decision so like based off of like this let's say uncertainty that that's in this posterior like what do you do right which is then like a separate but also like obviously very related discussion you know that's a Tremendously good point, which I kind of forgotten about is I think BDA and some of the other books make this point pretty clear that this is only like stage one, you also have to do some decision analysis. But when you do that, you should bring the entire posterior forward like am I going to like yes. right so am I going to calculate what you know, what is what's you know. What's see what you know what does it mean not to succeed in a climb you know peak maybe is it, is it death is it like just you know yeah bummer? then that kind of <laughs> has to go into your right in, into your calculation somehow so that's a whole second stage of decision analysis which uh, there must be some uh, good follow on book for that too right yeah speaking of follow on books I just wanted to point out the book points out <laughs> a couple books for further reading one of them is Beyond uh, Multiple Linear Regression which I actually looked at it looks pretty cool. Uh, it's mainly just about uh, multi-level models and stuff. It's not, it's not a Bayesian book though. It's a traditional maximum likelihood type uh, approach. Um, but I did a quick scan. It looks good and it is free online. So I point that out. I don't know, I'm not prepared to start any book clubs on that right away, but that's something to consider in the future. For Bayesian, they recommend this book called Data Analysis Using Regression Multi-Level Hierarchical Models, which is a Gelman book, Gelman Hill book. Not available for free online, unfortunately, and I don't have much idea what's in it. It's kind of older, 2006. And if, uh, Gelman and Hill and Vettari, Vettari are updating that book into a two volume set. The first one, which is out and is free, called Regression and Other Stories, which kind of goes a deeper dive into just linear regression, um, you know, just hammering it. And as far as I could tell, and then the second book called Advanced Regression and Multi-Level Models, which so far is just an empty web page. So I don't know what's the status of that is. <laughs> but I do want to point out there is a book club for regression of the stories that will be starting soon, TM. Um, I signed up. Uh, there's a channel for it. If, yeah, so did um, Pardon? Yeah, okay, I good. have that book so too. It's, uh, we don't, yeah, I do too. And I, I'm looking forward to digging into it myself. So. Um, that's one. I'm, oh, I'm going to be leading that one. Uh, well, leading, I should say, facilitating that one. Yeah. And so we haven't. I think uh, the decision for when that's going to be will be made next weekend. I think, as we said, right? Or no, it is after 19, after Halloween. To the I mean, 19th. No, it was, I think it's tw- yeah, the 28th. Oh no, this weekend. Okay. Um, I thought it was the 28th. I could also. So it is after on, Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. I think he did say something after Thanksgiving. He wanted to do it after the holidays. Yeah. No, but I mean, I think, yeah, depending on what the time is, I think that could fit into my schedule. It's also been a book that I've been reading, meaning to read too, meaning to start. And hey, these book clubs are pretty, I mean, this is the first one I did. Um, and they definitely keep you <laughs> like a lot more honest about reading yeah, sure. through the material. No, he's going to, it says here he's going to do it this weekend, uh, 1119, oh, awesome. to choose a time. And then, but it's actually not going to start until after uh, Thanksgiving. Got it. Sure. Okay. So I totally misread that. <laughs> Yeah, I like this book because he one thing the, my favorite quote from this book, which I haven't read the book, but I just happened to find I was looking for something else in there and I ran into this great quote and it's like uh, fake data as a way of life. This, I just love that whole concept philosophically. Right? He, the, part of the philosophy he has is you, you know, generate fake data for your model and see how your model fits it and try, it helps you understand what it's, what's going on with it. That's that is that is in a lot of biostatistics and a lot of medicine that's increasingly becoming I mean, you know, like doing those types of things, not just, you know, looking at data, but doing simulations and doing the kinds of things to show durability yeah. under a variety of conditions. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, I kind of ac- like- accidentally discovered this myself when I was doing my uh, grad work. 
my, yeah, I had a really complicated physics experiment with a pretty complicated model, a difficult mm-hmm. to fit model, right? So I ended up coming with this very complicated, to me anyway at the time, statistical model and simulating it. And that really helped me understand how my data should look. I mean, I had my data, I knew what it looked like, but the fact that I was able to produce simulated data that looks similar gave me a, a warm fuzzy going forward on my data, my analysis. Right? Yeah. I think I understood well, like- more about what was happening. I also even feel like with like, at least with the Bayesian, like the whole like Bayesian workflow is just like, there is a lot of, I feel like it's like a more baked in. I mean, I've only done so much statistical modeling. So like I could, th- this could just be very naive, but like, I feel like in terms of like other techniques, there's a lot more like model crit- criticism, like baked into the workflow where I feel like, like other stuff like ML as an example, right? It's not, it doesn't feel like it's as, integrated you know what i mean like criticizing your model figuring out like how does it fail where's the uncertainty what is it doing good at what is it doing bad at right i feel it's you have to like check the model constantly like is this the right likelihood all that stuff oh sorry you're right bayesian is more generally a model-based approach i think like other like i mean i know there's bayesian approaches to a lot of machine learning stuff as well but mostly you don't think of it that way like Boosted trees. What, what's the model? I don't know. There's really a model there. What's the model? You know, for the neural network. You know, it's, it's simulating. It's nothing, right? There's, it's not a model. But I think there are ways to do to rephrase those things in a model type way. But it's not as straightforward as what we're as this is. So, yeah. Not to not to say there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that this is kind of a different way of looking at things. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Well, I, I I'm going to finish. I'm gonna, I'm going to finish this episode like I finished all of them, which is leaving slightly <laughs> early. That's great. Well, you made it to the end, though, right? Yeah, you did. I made it. Damn it. Um, I will see you guys on uh, Monday. Monday, yeah. Take right. care. Um, yeah, take care. Hey, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Man. I was gonna. I had some. I was gonna talk through some of these exercises. I don't know if it's worth if you want to do that or not. But um, sure, I have a few minutes. But yeah, a few minutes. Uh, so the first one was uh, you utilize the. You know, remember we, in chapter nineteen we used the climber data to model whether or not a climber had success. Um, while accounting for the grouping structure, the expedition ID and the peak ID, right? So yep. now. Uh, he's saying, what are these, each one of these variables, is this a climber level, expedition level, peak level, or, or, or sorry, or peak level predictor, right? Yeah. And this is, so height is like what I mentioned earlier, right? Height is clearly peak level, peak. right? Peak, yeah. Age would be climber. Age, age yeah. could be Unless climber. Peak, I mean, but no, it's age. Yeah, yeah, that's actually <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. Age. It's like, maybe if you know the age of the mountain, maybe that's like somehow that like correlates to, I don't know, but like yeah. probably they have the climber count yeah. i mean so i had to count. look that one up yeah that, i mean actually is it just like climbers on the expedition okay and then the expedition roll yeah you can look yeah yeah that would just be right like the climber and then first ascent year uh that would be the peak yeah peak level peak right yeah, yeah that's basically what i was i think that's what i said yeah uh, yeah yeah, so to understand the count, I had to look at, you know, question mark climber or something to see what that variable really was. So. Got it. Okay. This one's kind of weird. The exhibition role is like, it is peak, it is climber thing, but it also, you know, there's only one, you know, leader or whatever. I don't know. I wonder how that folds in, but maybe what we're like, thinking it. Yeah. And... So the... The next exercise, the next two exercises have to do with this widget factory. Did you look at this one at all? I did it's not know. Interesting. Um, so the researchers enlisted three different workers at each of four different factories for a study, right? So each worker produced five widgets and the researchers recorded the number of defects in the widgets. These guys are not big on lots of data collection, by the way. Right? But anyway. <laughs> I know, they should be <laughs> making more widgets. <laughs> But in any event, there are two grouping variables in the study. Name them. Well, it's clearly, I didn't even bother putting an answers thing because these are pretty obvious, right? And it's the yeah. factory in the market, yeah. right? Yep. And I didn't make a diagram, but you know how it would look. It's nested. It is a nested data structure, right? Because Yeah, because it's like you have like, you know, like factories factory. and then you have like, you know, from yeah. each of those, you have like three different ones. Like I can see the workers. tree in my head. And the, <laughs> yeah. And then the widgets. Would so, be, yeah, you know, factories like, yeah. and workers and then widgets. Yeah. And then widgets, yep. Yeah. And then, and yeah, then I guess, yeah, that's okay. Well, here's a, be, yeah. 
So here's a reasonable model. They said, notice the small is only about intercepts. There's no, no uh, predictors, right? Yeah. Uh, so we're saying that the number of defects of the ith widget made by the jth worker at cat factor K is normally distributed with a norm that is got some global intercept plus a tweak for the um, worker and a tweak for the factory. And they're yep. normally distributed, right? It's one of them yep. independent and they all have some independent priors. So they say, okay, explain the meaning of beta zero in this thing. So, so how would you explain beta. that in words, I guess? I guess like, would this be like the average number of defects? Yeah, that's kind of, I think that's yeah. what I said. I hope I said or like that. median, yeah. Said median, but yeah. median average is the same. Yeah, like overall, right? Yeah, yeah the number of defects like overall. The overall parameter. And then the beta zero J would just be, J, right? It's worker J. So like how was like, let's, okay, I'll just use median, right? Like their median number of defects, right? That like a, the Jth worker makes. And then similar with, uh, well, the tweet all of like, zero, right? You remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. The added so, number, the added, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's like you're adding whatever they are to then the global. Yeah. <laughs> um, say, and then similar, yeah, right, with, um, similar with obviously the factory. And then finally, we have these, uh, these two, well, three, there's three uh, kinds of variability in this problem, right? Um, and he says, suppose that they have these median values, two, 10, and one. So sigma y is two, what? No, sigma y is two, uh, sigma b is 10, and sigma f is one. So it says compare and contrast these values in the context of widget manufacturing. So I have my answer, but I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. Right? Yeah. So factory to factory is 10, or sorry, two, one, the, worker to workers 10 and the within worker, I guess, is is one. Two. Oh, sorry, two. So yeah, like within worker, right? It's like yeah. you'd expect them, right? Like on average to <laughs> I was gonna say like curse, but like mess up, you know, have like which is for defects like at yeah. least twice. And then uh B would be is B sorry, B is between factories or B between uh yeah. Yeah, B is between factories. No, B so is between use... workers. Oh, between sorry, workers. B is between is workers. Yeah. And that is... I don't know why. Oh, that's speed of 10? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gee, like... Oh, God. Well, then, it, I mean, that... Well, that sounds like an interesting story, right? Where it's like, then there's a wide spread of like, right? Like there are some workers that make like not a ton of defects, right? But there's some that make like a lot of defects. Right? There's like a wide range, which is like then very interesting because yeah. that could maybe like, you know, if I'm thinking like the business uh, like point of it is like, well, why, <laughs> why is there so much variance yeah. in like widget making and defects? Like, is there like some sort of like process yeah, so that's like go breaking back, down? Right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe you go back and look at those workers and try to find some, you know, some group level predictors or something that help explain yeah. that, right? Yeah, and then it's actually interesting because then if if uh, the, if let's say then we're looking at between factories, right, with one, that would actually then indicate that like all of these factories have like similar types of workers that have exhibit a lot of variance in how they make widgets, which yeah. is then like, you know, could then indicate like a larger problem, right? Where it's like, this isn't just like localized to like a factory. This is, this is actually, all of them have like this similar problem of like workers having like a lot of vari various variation yeah. and like defects. That's kind of what I said. I think you said it better too, because I just said the small factory to factory standard deviation set suggested that the defects between factories tend to be similar, which is basically saying the same thing over and over. You made a good point that actually the workers apparently are not like clustered into particular factories or whatever. They seem to be more spread around, right? So the yep. factory factor deviation is small for that reason. That's a good way to put it. I like that. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So that's basically that's basically the end of Bayes rules. Now you're we're all experts on the <laughs> for all, for we're all, you know, for like Bayesian. a minute. And then like in a month from now, we're like, how do we do that again? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I think I think what I'm gonna do because I think no, exactly. But I think like what I'm gonna do is like really just I think I really just go through all the exercises like from chapter. I guess like yeah, yeah I think feel like, free to. I was gonna say, feel free to post on the Bayes rule or anywhere else. Like, if you do yeah. exercise, and you run into any issues, you want to get somebody else to take on it. Not no, that definitely. I don't have an I think... answer, but I, I would love to come <laughs> along with you and try to figure out what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, I, I think I want to do this more in R. Like, I've been playing more with like PyMC. I'm like, I don't know. It's like some, I, I like I love PyMC. Don't get me wrong. 
great library, but like, there are just some things where I'm like, Jesus Christ, I just want to like analyze this, yeah. or, like pull out this one thing. And it's more like, oh, uh, it's like, I just want to like, you know, all of this stuff. And it's like, oh, you have to write all these lines. Like, oh, come on, I don't want to do that. Or like, well, do we play it's a bit Bambi, more- you know, Bambi is pretty useful as long as you're not trying, I mean, you can't, it's, there's a couple of things I have trouble with Bambi when I was doing the Bayes rule stuff. One of them is you can't do like partially specify a prior and let it like, you can't just say, oh, I want this to be a normal distribution for the prior. You figure out the standard deviation. It won't do that. Once you start yeah. specifying priors in Bambi, you have to specify it all yourself. Yeah. Or you let it do it, in which case you may not get the, the type of form of exp- uh, distribution you wanted. And the other issue was doing this posterior prediction. You can't do with group levels anyway. You can't just say, oh, give me, uh, you know, a new group, you can't put in a new group in there. It has to be an existing group for a positive when you put the new data in. So if you want to do a new group type thing, which you'd have to um, do it yourself, essentially. So just pull wait, out you the said, posterior samples and start messing with them. Well, I mean, can you just, you could just add the posterior predictive to the inference data object, right? So you could like just do like, you know, with your yeah, model. Yeah, you could do that, but and when, you you do that, when you run it. that predict, yeah, when you run that predict, for new data, for new predictions, you're, you're trying to make predictions for new things. That doesn't work as well as, as seamlessly oh, as it does, for example. In- yeah, because I think it's okay. right in PyMC, you have to specify, right? It's like a mutable data container. And then, yeah, that's I don't know how you do that. But yeah. yeah, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, that's Bambi. A- no, in Bambi, you can say, I want new oh. data. It's fine if you're, okay. doing, if, you, if you're not doing group level things, but the new data must be existing groups. You can't do the new group. That little thing where you go, give me oh, a for a new group. shoot. Okay. It won't do that. It, just, it won't say, it says, hey, that's not one of my levels. And I asked some asked about this and they just said, yeah, that's something you can't do. So, but um, mm. uh, you have to do it yourself by just going back and, which is fine. I think it's okay. Um, because if you're at that level, your analysis starting to look at it, you probably want to start looking in more detail at the, posterior yeah. draws themselves anyway. So it's not a yeah. big fall failing. I mean, I'm starting to think the right way to do these things is to use like Bambi and just use default priors just to do your initial exploration of models. But once you start doing actual, you once you've kind of settled on a couple of models, you might want to start writing out full PyMC models. Yeah. You know? It's definitely uh, not as bad that as like Stan. By, uh, that book, Bayesian Modeling and Computation in Python, which I keep meaning to get to one of these days, we talk, well, when we talked about, right? Yep. He says, I says, you know, he, automatic inferencing, yes. Automatic ma- model building, he says, no. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of <laughs> get that. You When you type in like a single line, like formula, and you, you, you're not really sure what it's doing. It's like, that's not a good thing, right? <laughs> really? No, for sure. It's, you, it's, like... yeah, it's good at the beginning for exploration. But at the end, when you start getting publishing level or, you know, you might want to pull it apart and start building the model from scratch. Well, it's funny. I it um, also don't mean to keep you too long, um, but um, so like, obviously like when we were talking about, you know, simple linear regression, it didn't really click for me that we, when we were talking about, let's say um, we were estimating, right? Like the normal distribution, mu and, you know, sigma, it didn't really click for me that like, obviously like that regression part goes into mu, obviously, right? Like beta zero plus beta one and whatever your predictors are. It didn't really click in that for me until I yeah. wrote it out in pi MC. I'm like, Oh, okay. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Cause like, right with R, it's just like, you know, Y tilde, boom. And then you like, you add your E-pred draws, right? The expectation from the posterior predictive. And then you just like run with that. But then it didn't really make, it didn't, yeah. I don't know, for me at least it didn't cl- click until like, I like saw it at least in Pi MC code. I'm like, oh, okay. That, that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. And plus you, some things are easier in the end if you do your own Pi MC, like you can include the constant data which uh, Bambi doesn't do, which only you could you like plot LM or something like that. It won't work because you don't have to you want to work as easily. You can do it, but it won't work as easily because you can't don't yeah. have some data in there for the X, the X parameter, whatever the predict the predictors, right? It's not yep. actually in the, the inference data object. Yeah. But anyway, cool. All right. Well, well look forward to uh, seeing you in the few other book clubs. And uh, this was, a, this was fun. I'm glad we, we mission accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's awesome. Happy about this. this. Yeah. Well, I will see you Monday, chapter three. Advanced. All right. Yeah. Have a good one, Ron. Bye. Advanced. Exactly. Yeah. You too.